Immense despoiling. All right. And <laughs> yes. Mon Mothma died and they cloned her. How dare they? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and with that, yes, we are teasing about spoilers because obviously in our review of Andor, there's going to be spoilers. It's the nature of the beast of doing legal analysis based upon the facts presented in an episode. My name is Joshua Gilliland, and I am one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me in order as they appear on my Zoom screen, Jordan Hoopert, Thomas Harper, Stephen Tollerfield, and Bethany Danton, as we gear up for our mission uh, to discuss uh, the legal issues and military analysis, because we have two officers who've been in the service. Uh, about Andor episode five, The Axe Forgets, which is a really, really high stress way to talk about juvenile detention centers. So this episode, we see Andor wakes from uh, a night in a hammock to see that his stuff is gone and that one of his compatriots is going through his material possessions, raises some issues. Stephen, I think you put the notes down on this, or it was Jordan, whoever it was, help us understand what happened here. Yeah, I think I, I threw some notes in about um, trespass to chattels because it struck me that it's obviously wrong to take someone's stuff and go through it without their um, without their permission. And that's a tort, it's a personal injury to um, trespass someone's chattels, which is just personal effects or personal belongings, as opposed to real property like um, land. But um, in order to be liable for trespass to chattels, you have to prove intent and actual harm, which is assumed if you're dispossessed of your chattels, and then obviously lack of consent. Um, Skeen didn't um, try to defend himself at all. He really just said, yeah, I took your stuff. It's all here. Um, and the thing about trespass to chattels is that you don't have to have an intent to permanently deprive the person of their property, like if you were stealing something or um, like the crime of larceny. It's really just interfering with someone's possessory interest in their stuff, which is what um, which is what Skeen did here. Um, it also struck me too that Skeen um, said, told Andrew that if he had any complaints, he should talk to Vel about it because Vel was the one asked Skeen to go through the stuff just to make sure that there wasn't anything um, of concern. And so that raised to me the idea of <clears throat> sort of agency or vicarious liability when um, employees or um, vicar employers are vicariously liable for the torts that their employees cause while the employees acting in the scope of their employment. So if Andrew were to sue, um, Vel, um, he could probably uh, maybe try to get to the deeper pocket of Vel, and it doesn't seem like anyone has much money uh, to to compensate him for this trespass to his property. But he could probably hold uh, Vel liable for that uh, trespass. But um, ultimately, he didn't. Um, you know, there wasn't any sort of damage to his stuff that was apparent, other than um, raising a lot of suspicion with Skeen, which played out later. Nicely said. Now, if you, know, you have Thomas Hobbes wanting uh, laws with teeth, if I remember my political theory correctly. And then you get uh, Locke with his view on that's, that's heavily influences Madison. And then you get Nimick. Now, if uh, uh, Palpatine is following Hobbes turned up to 15 on a scale of five, Nemec seems to be channeling Locke and Madison and uh, to a degree. And one of you, I believe it was Jordan, raised the issue of elemental rights. Uh, can you expand on that, please? It wasn't me. I'm happy to try, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> even was it you? <laughs> that would have been me, too. That was just okay. my stream of consciousness. Yeah, I just it struck me when, um, when he was talking about his, um, his manifesto that he's writing, that Nemec is um, penning, he referred to elemental rights, which just struck me as a really fun Star Wars-y way of referring to fundamental rights, uh, just sort of a different, uh, a close word, sound, a close sounding word, but not quite the same thing. But it just struck me that whenever you're talking about freedom fighters or political theory or legal theory, 
of defining what it is that we think that everyone's kind of entitled to as a as a matter of natural rights or um, things that um, describe freedom and what the specific contours of that look like. Um, I think everyone can agree that, as I said, Skeen said they built a lot of cages that people ought not to be locked up um, for no reason or for um, arbitrary reasons. Um, that's sort of a key concept of liberty. But once you get what else that encompasses is really squishy and varies depending on the the political and legal culture of different countries and the legal cultures of different states, even here in the US. So I just thought it was an interesting word that the writers chose to throw in there because it's about fundamental rights. Well, I, mean, I, would, I would not use the word manifesto. I would use treaties or declaration. Uh, that's the, the positive view. Because normally when you think manifesto, it's somebody living in a shack in the woods in Montana and they send bombs through the mail. They're not the people that you want. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have a positive connotation to it because it means crazy person. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's not good mojo. So it's definitely not good mojo. Uh, now, moving forward after uh, a manifesto, we have uh, definitely Thomas weighing in on unprivileged combatants. Can you help us understand what that is? Yeah, so one of the, the fascinating aspects that's going to continue out through this entire series is this idea of what the rebellion exists as. And we see it in a microcosm of sorts with this with Val and her team. Uh, they are, it, it's interesting, they toast the alliance toward the end, toward the end of the episode. There is no formal rebel alliance yet, not, not one that's been openly declared. Um, I saw somebody rightfully took issue with the capitalization of the A in alliance in the subtitles, but that's, a, that's another dorky conversation for another day. However, uh, the important thing to recognize is that, that that strike team, that insurgency team, and the loosely organized alliance as a whole, whatever you want to call them, they're not members of a sovereign state, right? They're an insurgent group. We talked about this a little bit already in, in the couple uh, prior episodes of the show, but it's an interesting discussion in terms of category because international law, the law of war envisions everyone, all anybody on a battlefield, whether you're uh, just living your life and you, a war erupts around you or you're a soldier deployed to fight there, as having categories, as having status, sort of, you know, think about immigration law where you, you deal very heavily in uh, the status of an individual. Well, status matters on a battlefield for many of the reasons that we've talked about in prior episodes. One of the biggest is, is how you're treated. Can you be targeted? What happens to you when you get captured? How do you have to be, how does a uh, capturing force have to treat you? Can you be tried and held legally responsible for the things that you do on the battlefield? All those things are critically important and they all trace back to status. And the issue for Val and her team and, and Cassian by extension is that they operate in this nebulous uh, middle region. They're not affiliated with a state because there is no state under the boot heel of the empire. And the empire has no incentive to recognize them as any type of organized armed force. If you look sort of uh, in the, the beginnings of uh, like post 9-11 Iraq, Afghanistan, you saw the US carve out this, uh, this sort of middle ground term uh, called unprivileged combatants or, or uh, unlawful combatants. The term is found nowhere in the Geneva Conventions. I think it may be mentioned in GC3 offhand, but it's not defined. Um, in fact, when, when the status question has been taken up at at least one international tribunal coming out of Yugoslavia. The court there really laid out in clear terms that there's no middle ground status that would allow for you to jockey with somebody's rights. You're either a civilian or you're a combatant and therefore a prisoner of war if you're captured. The US created some legal wiggle room for itself and, and it remains controversial to this day by sort of creating this legal fiction of an unprivileged combatant. In other words, someone who is operating outside the bounds of the normal laws of war, outside the Geneva Conventions. 
And therefore, in our case, the, the president of the United States is, is vested authority to make determinations about that status and uh, what happens to those folks. That's why controversy surrounding Gitmo still uh, exists to this day. In any event, all that's to say it's a huge legal risk for Val and her team because the, the empire, especially in the case of a burgeoning rebellion, one that they're trying actively to snuff out, would have every reason to look for this sort of like nebulous middle ground status that would allow them to, you know, quite frankly, squeeze information out of them about the larger rebellion, things that would be useful to, to, uh, to get out. And they have no, no incentive to, to do things like offer them a public trial, uh, give them basic due process rights. Uh, as, as brutal as it sounds, uh, you know, protect their basic human dignity, all things that, that the law of war exists uh, to, to protect in individuals, even if you're there fighting on the battlefield. So it's Could, a dangerous do, state. Do mercenaries, oh, do mercenaries fall into this category? Because we like touched on this briefly before, mm -hmm. but is that how uh, the U.S. would view mercenaries? So mercenaries are sort of in the, a category of their own. If they fit the real narrow definition under uh, the additional protocols, uh, they are they're entitled to a baseline of protections under what's called uh, additional, pro or, excuse me, common article three of the Geneva Conventions. That protects basic things like human dignity, you can't torture, uh, that sort of stuff. They specifically as a mercenary would not be entitled to uh, POW type protections, combatant immunity, uh, but most importantly, they would be entitled at least to a trial under domestic law. Unprivileged combatants aren't even entitled to that. So that's why you see uh, that that's the legal fiction that allows for somebody to be held at Guantanamo Bay for, uh, you know, going on 20 years now or 20 plus years. Um, it, it, it's like a legal purgatory in a way. And so you can imagine for somebody like Vel or Cassian, they would rather die in that facility than be captured by the empire. And it has nothing really to do, or it has less to do with their desire to protect the, the alliance's secrets and more to do with the certainty of what's gonna happen to them at the hands of the empire. Well said, and- I'm glad to bring the mood up. That's what I'm here to do. Do you do children's parties? <laughs> I mean, what's, uh, what's your kid's birthday like? I'll dress up like, uh, it's like Ghostbusters 2, where I come in, sing a song, and then depress you with the loss of war. <laughs> then all the kids ask for He-Man. <laughs> yes. I get that regularly. <laughs> good deep cut. Very good deep cut. All right, let's get into the next issue that we have to- analyze here. And that is, well, there's a lot in this episode that happens. Um, so let's bring me back to where did my notes go? That window. All right. We have uh, a discussion about tattoos, which brings up the quote of uh, the act forgets. It also means, uh, it sounds like a really bad motto for a juvenile detention center uh, because it, you know, the tree remembers <laughs> is the, the uh, second part of it. So if kids are sent to a place where the motto is the ax forgets, you can understand that they're gonna get chopped down to size. We're apparently both uh, and or and uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, steam uh, seem to have endured one of those. Uh, Jordan is the public defender, and could you share your, your thoughts on is this concerning? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, this is concerning. Um, Cassian says he's 13 when he's sent to this whatever detention facility. I don't think we see how old Skeen was, but it, it's at least implied that it was a similar age. And I mean, that's troublesome. If you're locking away kids who are kids, then that's real, real problematic. And unfortunately, I mean, we do that in our country. We're in a, an interesting time for that where there's a shift in a lot of uh, a lot of the way states look at juveniles, where they are starting to realize that juveniles brains are still developing and there's a lot of room for things like education um 
but we still incarcerate and in prison a lot of kids and i did a check because i was curious um there are a lot of states where you can actually be tried as an adult for various things even as young as uh 12 in montana so good on you montana um yeah Hopefully that uh, that switches to more of a treatment model everywhere. Um, I know Oregon is, I won't say great, but pretty good. And at least where I practice, they really do try uh, to exhaust a lot of treatment resources before they go for, here's your cell, have a good day. Um, but yeah, it is concerning. and. It reminds me back throughout most of the 1990s with the initiatives in California was everyone wanted to be tough on crime. And it's a law and order state. And if you're not voting for enhanced penalties, you're against the you know justice. And, and so throughout, in large part, this reaction to the public class murder in California but throughout all of the 90, the remainder of the 90s and into the early 2000s, the initiatives that were passed for uh, reforms added life sentences, uh, you know, try a kid as an adult, uh, let's, you know, add the death penalty as frequently as often. California, and, California had the real famous three strikes law. Yep. Yep. You know, my grandfather did work with uh, prison ministries. And uh, the gentleman he mentored you know, was in on three strikes. And the third strike was stealing quarters from a vending machine, you know, and which is like, yeah, that's a lifetime punishment right there uh, for being stupid. Um, so when you think in terms of the enhanced penalties that we developed with, you know, charge a kid as an adult, it, you know, it, has an origin that that you can look back to when did we start doing this now you do have the factor of you know kids under 18 committing violent crimes and the issue of what do you do about that and then you know many states it's charging as an adult so there there's a darkness uh to this uh but when you throw in we're gonna have a supermax prison for teenagers uh it's it's ugly territory Based on the timing, like the age of Skeen and Cassian, this would have been the early days of the Empire. And we, we've certainly seen, you know, I think, the, the opening scenes of Rogue One, where you see Jim locked up on Wobani. Incarceration is a frequently used tool of the Empire. And, and that was the Empire sort of in its heyday, right, like close to its height. I can't imagine what the circumstances were at the outset of the empire. So certainly the Republic had a presence, but you had the empire in rapid expansion mode. I have to believe that folks like Skeen and Cassian would have been left to the authorities on their own planets, whatever planet that, that they were captured on. And so you, I, I could easily foresee a situation where you have a complete lack of regulation and oversight by imperial authorities. I mean, if they're willing to let corporate tactical forces run wild and run uh, entire sectors, it's it's not a leap to think that they would do the same for for prisons and and just let that just contract out that sort of responsibility. And this is the end result that you get. Uh, you, probably, an un, I, I would wager that the the planet that Skeen and Cassian were imprisoned on, things look different there than on Alderaan or Chandrilla, uh, you know, a core world. Uh, and the opportunities are different and then it, it, it grinds people down in a different way. And I think it, it's fascinating to see sort of the by, what happens to the byproducts of that system, the people that are put through that system years later. You know, we, we see it time and again in our own society, here the empire's having to reckon with it in a way. Yeah, they, uh, again, it's the nature of uh, any discussion about incarceration versus rehabilitation. And in most states in the United States, we've abandoned rehabilitation. You know, with, we'll just store people 
and uh, we don't need education. We just score people. The really also, sad. I wouldn't be surprised if um, Thomas, as you're saying, I would strongly suspect that the empire would leave it to the different planets and the different sectors to just figure it out, but lean towards incarceration, especially given what we're seeing in these episodes of like, oh, wow, like you have like overshot the mark of incarcerated people. Like that's definitely what the empire is going for. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they had some type of imperial propaganda program that they required to be run at these facilities. Um, Cause the, the level of venom with which the characters are speaking about these facilities, I don't think it's like venom connected with the empire. I think if they just, we're like, oh, this one facility, this one warden was terrible, then they might not attribute all of that to the empire. Where it's, if it's like, well, the empire locks up a lot of people and leaves them all to rot and subjects them to terrible things and propaganda, then I can see that level of venom. Like basically. reconditioning centers or re-education centers is sort of yeah. really re-education scary. Through labor. Yeah. yeah. Re-education through torture. Yeah. yeah it's uh, those always do well to recruit for the other side, which is why you have a team of people willing to go rob an imperial facility of its quarterly payroll. So again, they're they're recruiting. Uh, those will bring about their downfall. Which brings us to something that's a little less ominous to discuss, and that's altitude requirements for aircraft. So we do see a TIE fighter buzz our heroes close to the ground. I learned to fly before I could drive a car. Uh, I have good memories of hopping into a Cessna 150 kill. And uh, you know, family of aeronautical engineers, yeah, there's, there's something in the blood about that. So could you just go buzz the farmland at like 50 feet off the deck? And the answer is, hell no, you cannot do that. So the uh, federal law is over congested areas, whether it's a city, town, settlement, or any open air assembly of persons in altitude of a thousand feet above the highest obstacle within a, a horizontal radius of 2000 feet, is required for any aircraft. Now, this open area of farmland really doesn't look like uh, it's just animals grazing and there's uh, um, shepherds. What else can we learn about this here? Well, there's a nice requirement for anywhere, uh, an altitude allowing if a power unit fails, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. If the tie lost its engine, it's going to spin out and leave a nice scar on the surface uh, where that pilot rightly deserved to uh, not be in the gene pool anymore. Uh, yeah, but TIE fighters are always navigated with such responsibility and so carefully. <laughs> They're so easily controlled, right? It's <laughs> designed to be able to crash. Uh, oh, no. No, they're not designed to be able to crash land. Yeah, they're... The, these things do not look aerodynamic. It, it, they, they're not going to glide. It's going to uh, go he head over tail uh, repeatedly. The only thing, there's only a couple aircraft in Star Wars that look like they could sustain any type of uh, at least you know, like glide in for a rough landing. Uh, that would definitely be the A-wing. It's the only thing that looks like it has a lifting body. And it, so it's like a flying wing into itself uh, that that could at least have a controlled crash for a landing. That might be it. Uh, I don't think an X-wing would fly well. The don't count the Y-wing well. wing out. What was that? Don't count the Y-wing out. You know, Chopper is still with us today because a <laughs> Y-wing sur survived that crash. I think it would fly like a brick, but it could- a Beautiful deadly brick <laughs> and when they explode those engines just come off so nicely <laughs> i know it's, it's almost it's like probably a safety feature <laughs> like poetic the y-wing might be able to to pull off a landing but but not easily 
Um, so yeah, very few of these aircraft actually look like they could do atmospheric flight with what we understand, you know, wind to move over a wing to create lift and counteract drag and fight gravity and all the things that you have because of thrust. Anywho, uh, Wisconsin is a state that actually has some very specific laws prohibiting reckless flying, which arguably was TIE pilot did. So Wisconsin statute uh, section 114.09 says no person may operate an aircraft in the air or on the ground or water in a careless or reckless manner so uh, to endanger the life or property of another, determining whether the operation was careless or reckless. The court shall consider the standards for safe operation of aircraft prescribed by federal statutes or regulation governing aeronautics. Uh, so some of these factors that could include anyone who buzzes dives on or flies in close proximity to a farm, home, any structure, vehicle, vessel, or group of persons on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. We got them. <laughs> Throw the book at the pilot. <laughs> this, this isn't buzzing the tower. He's not playing Maverick. It's, I am going down to the deck and I want the uh, shepherds to be scared of me. Yeah, the there is... I watched it the first time I thought, could he have been, could he have justified it as a, there was a reconnaissance need. I need to get closer to see these folks. Um, and what became clear, especially because he traces along the water and kicks up the river there, there's an open disgust of the, the Aldani people amongst the Imperial station there. They're resentful. They, they don't want to be there. You hear two of the crew members uh, later talk about how it's not anybody's first choice of station. I think that the morale is probably low there and they look for any chance that they can get to, to stick it to uh, uh, the locals, which, which they clearly view in a, uh, in a derogatory manner. And so what better way to do that than take your loud TIE fighter and then scare off all their livestock and cause, I mean, it's, it, it was the kind of action that, that was done. And there would, I would not be surprised that that was not the, if that was not the pilot's first time uh, doing it, I, that, that seems like something that was practiced. And there is a provision in the uniform Co code of military justice. So that the uh, body of criminal law that governs the military, for reckless operation of a military vehicle. A lot of it, you typically see it charged uh, for uh, like drunken driving, driving um, if, if somebody gets behind the wheel of a military vehicle or their own um, on post, uh, but it it's not limited to that kind of operation. And so it's a standard definition of, of reckless that the military doesn't uh, use any special meaning for that term. And I think this uh, this would clearly qualify there. Um, it, it's probably highly it's highly dangerous as is to fly a TIE fighter under normal conditions with like nothing around you but space. Um, but to fly it that low uh, along terrain like that, uh, just for the purpose of annoying or scaring locals, I, you know, I think you've got a strong case there for um, for reckless operation under Article One Thirteen. The issue for the pilot is that stopping short of like a court martial, if if the empire has any sort of framework resembling the real world military, uh, at least within the army, they could put him before what's called a flight evaluation board. So, so come after his flight status. And that's not considered a punitive measure. So you're not gonna go to jail if, uh, if that doesn't go in your favor, but it can strip you of your ability to get in the cockpit. And, and that to, to folks with wings on their chest can be a worse punishment. Like some of them would rather go to jail for 30 days than, uh, than lose their ability to fly. So I, I don't know that any of that's in play given the, the leadership at this particular garrison, but it's certainly something that's, uh, that's a risk there for the pilot. Yeah, it's just, if someone flying the X-37B buzzed the International Space Station, they wouldn't get to fly the X thirty seven B anymore. Like you, you just <laughs> done. <laughs> I mean, blaze of glory to your career, but done. You don't get to do that. Um, on, on the other hand, though, with a a 
government that one could say is more authoritarian in nature. The Russians launched their direct ascent to ASAT and uh, put the ISS at risk. And they're just like, meh, our cosmonaut doesn't matter. It's fine. Again, and that does presume that you have a government that values life. Now, if they did this on Coruscant and like somebody flew into a, an apartment building, there, like, on yeah. one level, the crisis is over because the pilot's dead. However, there would be repercussions throughout the rest of the chain of command. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Buzz the tower. <laughs> so, oh boy. With that said, we get, uh, we see our ISB heroes taking uh, stimulants or performance enhancing substances so they can stay awake and work late. Excuse me while I snort caffeine real quick. Just yes. hang on. Or she was just taking just a had a headache. <laughs> Those data pads, the print is so fine. It's a glare. <laughs> <laughs> if you worked if you worked for a major part of gas you'd be doing it too yeah. <laughs> she could have had a headache she didn't want anyone to know yeah but uh, <laughs> uh it, it looks like i mean again it's one thing to have a latte it's another thing to take amphetamines <laughs> so see uh, see we talk about a lot of things that are uh, that, that the Empire would probably look the other way for, or like, like the TIE pilot. Like, what are the odds that on Aldani, he's going to come up for any any actual punishment? Probably zero. I feel like drug use is on Coruscant within the ISB is something that is probably screened for closer than other crimes. So it might be a little riskier for, uh, for Dedra than, than we might just first think. Unless they are encouraging their people to work late and take stimulants to stay up. Uh, yeah, so I was going to drug use, yes, but if she's taking some type of legal stimulants, I mean, the, the US military has a pretty bad, pretty long history of overdoing ibuprofen, caffeine, um, energy drinks. Uh, we every year, people in the US military die during PT tests because they've had too much caffeine and they're running and their heart can't take it. Like these are problems in a workforce that works under high pressure, high stress environments, sometimes without enough people, um, all types of shift work, uh, a very competitive environment like you see in the ISB. So the that sort of a drive or pressure creates a situation in which people who are overworking are going to start relying on stimulants um, if, if they're not careful. Like that's just something that has been trending. It's a plague in the legal profession too. Um, so many mm -hmm. attorneys um, sort of self-medicate, um, trying to keep up with, you know, workloads, but also just the things they have to deal with from on a day-to-day -day basis can be really challenging from a mental health perspective. You know, you can just imagine, uh, again, I am not one of these guys, but you can imagine uh, someone who drinks five-hour energy drinks to get through the day, and then they take a sleeping pill of some kind at night. So it's just a collision course of chemicals. Uh, this is what I need to relax. This is when I need to wake up. Like, that's not a good way to live. And what's their decision making process if they're exhausted? Now, you know, granted, in this situation, uh, is it Dedra, even though it looks like Deidre, is trying to piece together uh, what, what sounds like neurotic behavior or the type of thing she'd get a medal for. Like, so it's a really hard decision with the mindset of, it's too random to be random. That sounds like paranoia. Uh, you know, it can be all of those things. It can't be, you know, like the answer is unfortunately all of it could be right. <laughs> that, um, yeah. Um, well, if you go back to the previous ep episode, she said that she had a hunch, uh, which was not well received, but maybe if she does have a particularly good instinct about those types of things because she is a trained officer. So uh, there, there's something in her mind because we know 
what the rebellion folks are up to. There's something in her mind that's catching something. She just hasn't been able to fully label it yet, uh, but she knows it's there. So I just don't think that she's found the the right way to put it into words yet. But yeah, the subconscious mind can pick up on things that the conscious mind is trained to pick up on and you just can't label it in the moment. I, right. I'm sure that all of you have experienced that in the legal profession of when you have like this moment of like, there's something here and then you, it, that it clicks at some point. 2 a.m. after 15 mm-hmm. Red Bulls that you've cracked to get <laughs> to get to that point. That's when the light goes on. Yeah. I'll say that I, that's a great point because I think that that absolutely is driving her. And I'll give credit. Uh, Aaron, one of the longtime friends of the show, was talking to me after the episode. And there's that quick scene where she and her uh, it's adjutant, assistant, whatever, I, I don't know his title, but they're going back and forth and he's rattling off a series of, of incidents. And he mentions uh, Kessel. And I, I didn't do the exact timeline on it, but that, that could very well be the coaxium theft that we see in Solo uh, that's referenced there. And so she's, it's not just like a random series of small things. It's like some pretty big, significant events uh that that have all the hallmarks and it's sort of like you're the only person that isn't taking crazy pills she's the only person that's seeing sort of the the vague lines connecting all of these and and she need it, it's not that she's frustrated that others won't listen to her it's that she is driven by that need to better connect those things to make the case and uh you know, it's a great point about uh, legal stimulants. I, I will be the first to raise my hand and say, you know, that they were uh, like in the lead up to, to trials. Um, you know, I'm very guilty of, uh, you know, going to the Red Bull or the the uh, the white monsters were always my uh, my demon uh, before trials. But I took um, those two for a time. Oh, the white monsters. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm glad I don't <laughs> the do white that anymore. Yeah, don't do it. Don't fall <laughs> down that rabbit hole. But no, it, and yeah. even the illegal stuff, the, the Navy SEALs just within the last two, three weeks had a big, uh, a big investigation start up over stimulant use uh, within the ranks. There was a, a SEAL trainee that died during Hell Week um, and it kind of popped the lid on something, a practice that's been widespread and sort of known about for a while in terms of misuse of PEDs in that case, but um, you know, I, I remains a piece. I, I'm very curious. I would, I would like to, I, not for her her character's sake, but I would like to see that issue kind of explored. Like if she's, if she, that's like an aspect of her character that we're going to see uh, on repeated instances. Just sort of a footnote for the whole um, workplace drug thing. I, did you all hear that um, the California legislature or Governor Newsom just signed the um, AB? 2188 that now allows or prohibits employers from discriminating against people who test positive for marijuana use off duty. Um, so now drug and <laughs> like that's not exactly performance enhancing, but it does um, it sort of limits um, employers' rights to, uh, to terminate people based on off duty drug use. And, and employers are kind of worried about it, obviously. Well, not obviously, but there's um, questions about this. The statute dist- makes distinguish uh, makes exceptions for different industries, but not for job description. So there's a so like it says that people who drive heavy machinery can still be tested for. Um, drug use, but it doesn't say like the off- front office workers of those same companies also can't be tested. So it's it's kind of hmm. weirdly drafted. But anyway, interesting little side note. Yeah, I would think the performance enhancing of uh, marijuana would be relaxing. So, I don't know if you're uh, if you're Snoop Dogg, that's absolutely a performance <laughs> enhancing drug for you. Yeah. I was going to say it depends on the performance you're looking to enhance. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's 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 interesting, though, because um, so the Space Force as a branch of service is completely overhauling how it's doing fitness and health. Um, as in January, it completely does away with a PT test uh, entirely, which is a first for any branch of service in the U.S. military. Uh, and it's moving towards having like a whoop band or an aura ring. So basically like a heart tracking device that you wear when you sleep and when you work out. Uh, and so 
it kind of gamifies fitness in a way because you're supposed to put in like X amount of, of hours of movement basically. So that could be walking, running, gym, yoga, swimming, whatever you want to do. Um, and it's non punitive in nature, but every six months to a year, you basically meet with a resiliency team of professionals that will exist at every space force base who will do a full blood panel, meet with you, talk to you. You you can have access to a weightlifting coach, uh, to a physical therapist, to a mental health professional. And the idea is to approach fitness in the military and health holistically, and not just about individual moments of performance, like a PT test. Um, Cause they're, you could, it, the, you could the, just call out the, the army. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the air totally force funny. does this too. Like the air force yeah. was infamous for having people who would uh, like barely pass their PT test every six months. They would start training for it like two months prior, kill themselves, get injured because they would go from zero to a hundred over the course of two months. And then the other four months, they would be completely not adhering to any type of fitness thing whatsoever. Uh, and yeah, that was a cycle for a lot of people in the Air Force. And you can see the data across time, which is one reason why the Space Force decided to change so drastically. Um, but it'll be really interesting because it radically changes the approach. And it's like, is your lifestyle healthy or not on a scale, a scale that's non-punitive and a scale that's like, how can we help you achieve your goals, whatever those are? Um, so it'd be very interesting. Yeah, that's fantastic. Your, your, your ring determined that your blood content is 98% white monster. We have concerns and you have to sit down with somebody. <laughs> yeah, so mine won't anymore. My white monster days are over, which is nice. So, uh, but yeah, the uh, I've been wearing a, a whoop band for a while now, not to derail the podcast too much, but... <laughs> the just the I feel like a very either strenuous work environment or a very uh toxic work environment do lead to very toxic behaviors individual behaviors in the long run um and I, I think we're seeing some of that in the ISB yeah it's like lawyers who end up having to go to the other bar because they end up with substance abuse problems and and then get into the road to recovery and then spend their time speaking at CLE events about how badly they screwed up and destroyed their life. So with that, it's it's a gateway. That said, the reference about Kessel made me wonder, since we're at 5 BBY, uh, Solo was around 10 or 11 BBY. So... I still think they could be talking about the same heist because that was significant. It was huge. It was huge. Yeah. And they lost a bunch of TIE fighters in the process. And just by way of comparison to uh, highlight real world, real world example of 9-11, there are a bunch of Al-Qaeda attacks leading up to that. Going back to the first attack on the Twin Towers, uh, in the early 90s, uh, but you also had the attack on the USS Cole, you had the attack on two US embassies. All of those steps throughout the 1990s led up to what happened on 9-11. This could be a similar thought that they're having, uh, except they haven't had Death Star 1 yet. Uh, they just have all of these random hits taking place. Now, whether or not they're organized or being coordinated, I think that's a matter for debate uh, because the rebellion at this point in time is not unified. So you could have Luthen having an organized activity, never hitting the same place twice, but you can also have independent actors uh, operating on Jakku and other places doing their thing. So not everything is a giant conspiracy board of, you know, like, I know what I saw. Like this could be, some of this is purely random and some of it 
it is organized. So it's, it's one of those that can be both. Which raises us to the fun of a, a great way to get people to hate the government is to take their property. So we, we hear the horrible story that the empire took somebody's farm where he had trees and they flooded it presumably to make a lake, which sounds very 1950s, Ike Eisenhower doing his thing with uh, all the internal improvements that we had after World War II with uh, the highway system. Because again, eminent domain was used to, to make the highway system and lakes and dams and all of these internal improvements for all the positive things that happened in the 1950s. Uh, on the flip side, when California voted to have a nice high-speed train to go from Northern California to Southern California, the population centers voted for it and then promptly said, not in my backyard, because they didn't want their homes getting taken to build the train. So that's why we're going to have a train to nowhere, from nowhere, uh, but it's gonna be awesome in order to get across the state. So unwilling to actually pull the trigger. So what that brings us to is how does eminent domain work? Well, we, we have some case law that we can look at. And the first is from 1886 and it's Van Brocklin v. Tennessee. The government may acquire and hold real property in any state whenever such property is needed for use of governmental a government in execution of any of its powers and when it cannot be acquired by voluntary arrangement with its owners, it may be taken in exercise of power of eminent domain. Now there's more rules with this. They just can't take your property and you're homeless. They have to pay you the fair market value of the property. Uh, here's a case from 1943 and it's, it's a block paragraph. So we'll, we'll hit highlights. The law of eminent domain is fashioned out of the conflict between the public's interest in public projects and the principle of indemnity to the landowner. We recently stated in the United States v. Miller that courts have had to adopt working rules in order to do substantial justice in eminent domain proceedings. Equality and fair dealing do not require the payment by the United States to the landowner owner of the amount of evaluation of his lands based on the existence of his privilege to use the power of eminent domain. It is private property which the Fifth Amendment declares shall not be taken for public without just compensation. The eminent domain can hardly be said to fall in that category. It is not a personal privilege, it is a special authority impressed with a public character and to be utilized for a public end. There have been recent public or uh, eminent domain cases. Uh, there are weird spins on eminent domain where property is taken in order to preserve nature. So that's happened, uh, but it's also been taken to what looks like, are you just screwing this guy? Like, so there, there's a couple <laughs> ugly twists that you can see with, with eminent domain. Because uh, it's a nice hot button issue that generally freaks people out. However, when we need to build a military base or build a freeway, uh, like where I lived in Redwood City, California, uh, eminent domain was used to build a giant shopping mall and movie theater that's really nice. Makes good money. They didn't quite do eminent domain correctly, and the local government got in trouble for that, and sued, and had to pay lots of money for the boo boo. So, taking a man's farm and flooding it sounds like classic eminent domain. Whether or not he was paid for it is another question. We've seen eminent domain used in uh, rebels, even if they're not using the phrase with uh, just the empire taking land on Lothal. And, and for those who didn't want to sell it, they end up just getting arrested instead. So just uh, not fun things to see. So there are some questions here that, that we don't know the answer to, like was Skeen's brother paid? It didn't brother sound paid. like it. No. Well, the fact that he then goes out and commits virtual suicide. Yeah. 
sounds like they they didn't pay him. They just took what he had. Those poor probably, pepper trees. Yeah, pepper trees that probably been the family for generations. It sounded like it was kind of all that he had too. Yeah. yeah. And not given just compensation. It'd be one thing we need to build a hydroelectric dam here to power our war machine. So we're going to pay you out. And now you can go have a pepper trees someplace else. Like none of that happened here. <laughs> like so they they took what he had, left him broken, and he killed himself. Radicalizes, so like, radicalizes his brother. I was like, that seemed like a nice callback to the kind of elemental rights idea from earlier in the episode in the podcast is like you have these rights to things like due process. So the government can't just come in and take your farm without some due process to you and some recompense or recourse if they do it wrong. Or hear me out, fascism. Well, yeah. <laughs> Accurate. They have awesome jackboots. That's I, yes. true. The half, is, I mean, they're magnificent. Is it worth it? The, the, col no, the collars, colors. no. Yeah. Definitely not the collars. <laughs> like, they almost had me at the boots and the hat, but not, not the, the choker collars. choker is just nope. a little much for you. It's uh, yeah. it, Just fold it down. Watching it's Dedra okay. just be like, in this episode, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's well, a no. It's a white jacket. Every human being sweats. Keeping that collar clean will not be a pleasant experience. Someone You're going to see her at home face. with yeah. wool light and a toothbrush cleaning every uniform, and it's not going to be fun. So, oh. no, at least the green ones, I mean, could hide it a little better, but the white, no, it's that's a that's an oxy clean commercial waiting to happen. So almost so. all of my trial shirts are white. The struggle is real. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It'll be great if you never sweat. <laughs> so, there was it's a good thing trials are such low stress environments. <laughs> there was a, a Sea Scout ship where they had a donation of uh, baseball caps for the scouts. And they were all white baseball caps. No, nope, and it's just nope, like, nope. do you not think the teenagers sweat? Was do you know how this is going <laughs> to end? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so with that, we see the first imperial base with handrails. I that should not <laughs> be forgotten. No one wants unpainted, to un unacceptably unpainted handrails. Maybe that's why they get rid of them. Those are too hard to paint. Nobody, nobody can keep up the maintenance. Because people Sorry. are always holding them, wearing the paint off. So the best solution is to remove the handrail. This is why we can't have nice, safe things. <laughs> you won't paint it and take care of it. We're cutting it out. Ah, which is ah, like the old Navy motto that I do not serve, so I heard. If it moves, salute it. Uh, if it doesn't, paint it. They broke that rule. So, uh, we have misbehavior behind the enemy with Lieutenant uh, Blevin. But misbehavior before the enemy. Oh, before the enemy. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. No, no, no. It's all good. Yeah, Blevin's a fascinating character and or considers continues to be rightfully concerned about the the idea that a uh, a flag waving imperial would defect um that the, the the sort of overall image of the empire at this stage of its, its existence is one of um unity like dangerous unity everybody there are no cracks in the facade yet and blevin is sort of one of the first ones misbehavior is a is a crime under the UCMJ unique to the military, you know, civilian world. We don't, we may have enemies like little E little, uh, little case, lowercase E, but not, uh, not the same kind of enemy as defined in the UCMJ. So uh, what's interesting about this crime, the last time that it was charged was against uh, a guy named Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, who folks may or may not remember. He made a lot of headlines. He was the last POW prisoner of war held by uh, the Taliban. 
And circa 2014, he uh, was located and uh, the, uh, a, a prisoner swap was arranged and he was released. Came back, uh, was immediately thrown into controversy, was investigated, uh, and ultimately charged with two counts, uh, one of desertion with intent to shirk hazardous duty because he left his base in Afghanistan and walked off. The other was misbehavior before the enemy, the allegation being that uh, he intended to go join and help the Taliban. Um, very, very famous, very controversial case. Uh, but in any event, uh, misbehavior is a, it can be a capital offense under under the UCMJ. So it's not always charged like that, but it can be it, it's. Uh, one of the graver offenses under the UCMJ is the whole idea, which is probably suggested by its name, is that you're doing something uh, sort of disloyal or wrong uh, that assists the enemy. You are, it, it's not misbehaving the same way like a toddler misbehaves. It is uh, not performing your duty properly as a United States service member and doing something that probably helps uh, the enemy. Couple things of note within there. Uh, enemy is is not limited to the the armed forces of another state. So it can be it, it specifically defines a rebel group in here. So uh, Vel and her group there would absolutely fit the bill here. Blevin can't claim ignorance. He knows exactly what these folks are about. He knows that they're armed. Uh, he knows what their intent is, and uh, he he is going along with it for his his intent and, and why he's helping them is really irrelevant in, in this calculus. Um, interestingly, this crime encompasses a lot of different kinds of conduct. So the, the sort of classical example would be like running away from a base. That's obviously not what Blevin is doing. He is uh, quite artfully playing the role of a, of a strict officer pretty well. Like I love the scene where he sort of weaponizes his uh, his anger or annoyance over this gantry that we just talked about to, to get uh, folks to go along with a lowered Manning roster uh, on the ground with the idea that he's being uh, magnanimous by allowing them to delay that duty for a couple of days until after this uh, after this big event. But for an officer like him, one aspect or one one bit of conduct that can be misbehavior is actually not doing the duty to a, a place that you're assigned uh, to be responsible over. So it could be a base, it could be just a guard post, something like that. Uh, the idea being that you have a set of duties over that place. In his case, Blevin appears to be the commanding officer or somebody within that chain of command with authority over it. He has a responsibility to protect that installation, to protect the people that are there and to execute imperial missions, whatever those might be, terrorizing locals with low-level flights and dismantling their holy places. I don't know. He's not doing that very specifically by allowing this, this team of rebels to infiltrate and cause havoc at a minimum, steal imperial property. They've already, uh, looks like, gotten a hold of imperial property in terms of probably some of the, they look to be holding E-10 uh, blaster rifles, which we've seen in Rogue One, so Imperial issue weaponry from some of the previews, they've very clearly got Imperial armor of some type. So he he is sort of committing a cascading series of offenses there. Uh, given the nature of all of this, the letting a rebel cell in, the likelihood that folks are going to die in the course of this this infiltration, contrary to to Bergdahl's case, which was not. Uh, what they call referred as a capital offense. So it was not, uh, the, the court martial was not brought as a capital case. His probably would be, almost certainly. Uh, the other piece is, uh, in, in all likelihood, they didn't go over it uh, in this episode, but I suspect that he's provided them with what they would call like counter signs. So, so signs and signals uh, that would help aid their entry into this place. They're going to have to act like soldiers. And part of that is knowing uh, bits of communication that would not just make them seem like soldiers, but give them access, so official words, that sort of thing. It is a crime to reveal critical information like that. It's it's obvious, uh, obviously very sensitive, has a security purpose behind it. It is a crime in and of itself to reveal information like that to the enemy. And so uh, what's interesting with all of this is that um, 
his motives are not entirely clear and why he's doing that. Cassian certainly suspects that, that there may be more to the story that maybe he's walking them into a trap. The, the line that we get from Val, the, the real basic line is that he seems to have fallen in love. Maybe she got killed. I don't know. He clearly had some sort of attachment to the, to the Aldani people and watched as the empire, um, you know, had their way with the people there and her her line was, you know, everybody uh, finds their rebellion or, or finds their way uh, in in their own unique way. Um, I don't think we're seeing the entire picture here because uh, he is. This is a. I, I like to talk about risk that characters are taking. He perhaps is assuming the greatest risk of all uh, of anybody in this this scenario. And I don't. So where know would that I where would this um, like misbehavior before the enemy? cross the line into treason because there's a lot of l- ranging from really small to actually pretty big things that lt blevin has done uh but but when would the line for like treason be crossed so i think you probably they are over like overlapping legal circles uh the idea behind treason is that you are uh sort of in a way, overriding or assisting uh, the uh, an enemy force, in this case the rebels, to to overthrow or or in, in some way throw off uh, the 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 lawful governing authority. I don't know that Blevin has crossed into that realm. I don't. I haven't gotten any indicator that he's attempting to to like. Josh is signaling me as if I've missed a fact. It's fun when. You- we get to highlight trivia to you. Levin's ISB. Gorn is the lieutenant in command of the airbase. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Jeez. Thank oh, you. I was like, oh, uh, you're yeah, right. My yep. my notes are my notes are sure. Replace Gorn with with Blevin and all of that. Blevin has committed no crime other than possibly misusing an illegal drug. Yeah. Gorn. Gorn. I was like, because like, what? It's like I was thinking, like, why? Because Go- I remember Gorn <laughs> from Star Trek. So the yes. fact that they picked a, Thank you. a well-known Star Trek name for this lieutenant is something that's stuck with me. And but Blevins given out, you know, uh, uh, the name Prefect like it's candy. It's like, hey, do you want this hotel? Like so <laughs> different. No. King of them in a domain. <laughs> the lieutenant. I will. Uh, I'll do my. I'll take my demerits and do my push-ups <laughs> after this. Um, the lieutenant, I, I don't get the sense that he has crossed the line into that with in terms of his intent. Um, maybe he would like to see the Aldani base get shut down, but helping the rebels steal a bunch of money um, doesn't really rise to, to what I would consider the level. I think if it's the Empire, they're going to charge him and, and you know, paint this the, in the worst possible light that they can. That's the beauty of being a prosecutor. You, like if you're unrestrained with an expectation that you're going to win the case or in the empire's case, if you're probably assisted in some ways, legitimate or otherwise in your prosecution of cases, um, their object is to, to make an example out of folks. And, and you know, it, it's not a complete stretch uh, to, to argue that he's committing uh, that level of offense. Both are capital punishment. So it's sort of like uh, Luthen's comment, they're going to hang you with the same rope either way. Yeah. You know? And so he, he did not like the little shrine, which is also called the temple, but it looks more like a shrine to me, uh, being used for target practice, you know, similar mm-hmm. to what Napoleon's troops using the Sphinx as target practice it was just like why why are you ruining that for everyone uh, he the sense that he did go native that he has a very strong affinity for the native people and to the fact that he loved one so the fact that he could be doing this is good old-fashioned revenge uh and you know he while he might be trying to set up a cover story for himself I don't think he can stay because uh, they're not going to act, the superiors will not act kindly upon him or this happened on your watch. So I think he should be getting into the shuttle with 
<laughs> with the he's going to lose a promotion twice. <laughs> yeah, like you're probably going to want to be someplace else for the rest of your life. So uh, take a cut and uh, live out your life on some moon someplace. So, Indoors nice this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta watch the Z walks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, good analysis. Very good analysis. Uh, which brings us to, well, back to Luther. He has a Jedi holocron. I mean, his his little shop is just full of Easter eggs for all the fans and I think somebody said that there were the stones from a uh, Temple of Doom in there as well. So uh, again, just the Lucasfilm people just having fun with all of us. Uh, why are you know, aren't Force artifacts outlawed by the Empire? Why does he have this? Wouldn't they be like forbidden? Uh, Jordan, did you or Stephen identify uh, this? This is mine. I. So I've been going back through and reading the uh, the Star Wars comics that Marvel is putting out, and I'm like three months behind or six months behind, whatever Marvel Unlimited runs. So sorry, um, but there's a a character that's running through. I think it was the Crimson Rain event that they call the Librarian, who is real mad at the Empire because in the Old Republic she was someone who studied Sith artifacts and artifacts connected to the force. But when the emperor took over, he made all of that illegal. And she like got totally washed out of academia and ended up selling fruit at a stand on some backwater planet um, or something along those lines. But so it was just surprising to me that Luthien is displaying this holocron blatantly in the open in his shop uh, it seems like a like a real bad career move for him maybe it's like a trophy is the way that they could handle selling it uh yeah that that does seem to be a mild legal, legal conundrum for him and they anyone had, else uh, want to weigh in they had a good scene in the comics where um, the Imperial troops come in and just wreck this woman's study and um, shop and we'll say credibly steal all of her artifacts and smash a couple. Um, so. yeah. It's in the back of the shop so nobody sees any of that. That's his secret black water, uh, black market area. It feels very much like it's like if you've been to Galaxy's Edge, like Doc on Dars, like a nice, clean version of Doc on Dars uh, yeah. antiquity shop. Fair. Yeah. Very fair. Probably similarly expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed there. So any other observations? Uh, Bethany, you watch with your intelligence eye. Any comments that we might have missed or something you'd like to bring up? I just, I, I, I still find it interesting that the ISB wants to be more proof oriented before finding anything out because well that that makes sense from a protocol perspective to to follow a lead when a well qualified well respected analyst has a an like an idea for something like it wouldn't hurt to then look into that because uh, analyzing is both an art and a science so if you are an imperial analyst and you know that certain elements of rebellion have shown these types of tactics or have used these types of weapons or have struck in these types of places, that's more of a science. The art would be putting together, hey, like what, what issues bother these particular rebels the most? What types of cultural issues are driving them to act? Um, 
what past historical issues are driving them to act? What can we learn about their hearts, their minds, their souls, uh, everything about them to figure out more about what they're going to do? Uh, and so it's a balance between those two things. And the empire seems to be really like stamping that out, uh, which is not, not a good effective idea because because people are emotional like or in the star wars universe beings are emotional and so you can't attribute everything to statistics and science so there but if, in order to launch an investigation when you have limited resources because even though the imperial resources might be vast they still have a breaking point that they want a minimum of probable cause before taking action so they don't go on wild goose chases. However, after things start blowing up on a more regular basis, that threshold might be a lot lower, uh, especially when, if you have to answer to Vader or Palpatine, um, that, that fear factor uh, of, I don't want to get shot today. Uh, I mean, like we, we see it in Mandalorian, Grand Moff Tarkin, um, excuse me, uh, Gideon, uh, just has people shot left and right, his own troops, and one or even for interrupting. <laughs> so uh, that could even be an a- empire, Josh, when uh, they launch all the probes at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back, and Vader comes on the screen. Is it could be anything? Smugglers or none? Of my, the rebels are there. Okay, let's go there. Please yeah. don't choke the- me. The line that precedes that, I want proof, not leads, you know, so it's mm-hmm. this uh, this sort of mechanical approach. It, it looks very much like I, what I imagine is happening behind the scenes somewhere in Moscow, that the, the kind of bend on intelligence that uh, that Russia is piping up because it's not much like the empire. It's not as if they don't have expansive means by which to gather intelligence and whatnot, but how that how that material is handled, the conclusions that are drawn from it, what gets actioned and what doesn't, looks very different from place to place and depending on the systems and, and you're seeing that play out in real time. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the success that you're seeing from the Ukrainians on the battlefield is driven by a lot, like a cascading series of Russian intelligence failures um up and down the chain so um yeah. well, perhaps, I just have... perhaps that's a driving factor here is a a not even a good leader but a shrewd intelligent leader whether or not they're a particularly good person or not would do well to take a talented analyst ideas and even be like a hey like chase this down in your spare moments here and there and bring me something when you find a trend yeah. Um, and we don't really see that happening here, maybe in part because there's a fear of highlighting any rebel successes or like, or, or saying, Hey, we think that the rebels are, are actually more organized, or we think that they're doing better than we've previously thought, or we, we think they have a chance of actually being successful in these areas. So you don't want to be the one in a scary fascist system with some terrifying leaders to, to start saying that your enemies might be successful. Definitely not in your sector and you're not gonna have some other junior ranking officer come make yeah. that conclusion in your backyard. Well, <laughs> then it's better to be proactive than to go, oops, a base blowed up <laughs> and, and have to explain that that's a mining disaster. That's the go-to. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that that was a mining disaster. And, and yet, you see that exact scenario playing out where people do not. Russians have not been wanting to tell Putin how badly things are going until it's so obvious they can't possibly avoid it. Yeah, the yeah. Again, we've seen this with "I'm scared of the leader." Therefore, we're not going to tell the leader the truth, and everything falls apart because of that. 
um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's like watching downfall and with all the imaginary divisions Hitler thought would save them. Like, no, no, we don't have any. So and people wonder why ruling by fear and assassination and mysterious, like pushing people out of hospital windows doesn't work very well. Yeah, again, when somebody has a bear attack in their apartment, we're going to call that a red flag. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just you know, weird. bears bears are getting rabid these days. It's very it's Ewok, it's, it's, Ewok. it's amazing Definitely. how good they are at picking locks. <laughs> yeah, picking locks, getting to the 17th floor. It's, I mean, very, very dangerous bears and packs of rabid dogs just killing political enemies. Yeah, that tends to have a negative effect on truthfulness at the office. Yeah. <laughs> and saying, yeah, we're winning in Ukraine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, yeah, all, yeah, you know, that's, that's a rough Tuesday. So, it's a rough Tuesday. Yeah. So, on that bright and cheery note, uh, we've covered a lot in this episode, and we're getting ready for the next, which if this pattern holds that we're going to go in uh, three-story arcs where we get a lot of setup and then probably lots of action in the third, which, uh, you know, is a nice payoff. So that's all good stuff. Show us a world, let us live in it, and then uh, take us to the next level. So it's all good stuff. So any closing thoughts from anyone? Seeing head shaking, no. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion tonight. Uh, this We are finishing up doing three po- episodes a week. So uh, as, as uh, She-Hulk and the Word X come to an end, that we will now uh, probably just be down to one or two, depending on what else is coming out. Uh, so until uh, our next recording, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay geeky. Thank you all.